All right. Good morning. Wow. Am I excited for this uh, Level Up call today? <laughs> My name is Gary Morris, and I am so incredibly uh, grateful to have so many of you on this call today. Uh, those that signed up on Zoom, those, those that have signed up through our networks, uh, and just those uh, of our friends and friends of friends, and, and hopefully a lot of your children that are going to spend the next hour with us. Uh, today's session is near and dear to my heart. It is about financial literacy for our children, teens, young adults. It's hopefully uh, just a glimpse into some of the things that we can do, we can be thinking about uh, so that our children can get a, a fast start to financial literacy so they can understand uh, some of the pitfalls that us as parents have made over the years and so that they, you know, start to, you know, be able to narrow down the things they can be thinking about to give them that advantage as they go through their teenage years, their adolescent years, and their, you know, their early years in their 20s uh, into their 30s. So my guest today is actually a co-founder of Dominion Lending Center, someone that I recognized and saw speak when we first started our company almost 15 years ago. Now, when I saw Kevin Cochran speak for the very first time, I immediately texted my business partner and said, we have to work with this guy. This guy was young at the time. I mean, that was 15 years ago and I you know, kept still young today. And he was just so amazing, his passion and his commitment to his craft. And I, I later learned that his passion in life and how he became such a good speaker was to actually spend time going out to middle schools and high schools teaching teens um, you know, financial literacy and making it fun for them in a way that they can comprehend and understand. He has been incredibly successful. He has uh, literally walked the walk and, you know, lives the talk. Uh, he has, uh, you know, become a, a multimillionaire uh, by the time he was 35 years old. Uh, and now he writes uh, a lot of the curriculum, the financial literacy curriculum for many of the um, trade schools, uh, Canadian universities, uh, and he's a dear friend of mine. Uh, Kevin, good morning and welcome to our Level Up series. Oh, Gary, thanks for the invitation. I'm jacked to be here and uh, thanks for that great introduction. But, you know, I've always said this and for any students that are watching, we're going to go through some great stuff here. But I'm by far a byproduct of my environment. And, you know, what I've learned from you and, and, and Chris and, and many others, uh, this is uh, just uh, an honor to be on this call as well. And uh, thank you very much. I think we're gonna have a great, I know we're gonna have a great session here. It's gonna be amazing. Well, it's cool, right? I mean, you know, kids are our future and, and you know, what resonates most to us is our children. And, and listen, I mean, I, I for one made a lot of dumbass mistakes when I was a teenager. I mean, I spent a lot of dough on a lot of stuff. I always worked and we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, and I had the freedom because I was working, but I think in a lot of ways it really shaped me early on. And, you know, I really sort of got committed to understanding and appreciating the value of hard work. And I know your story was no different. So why don't I turn it over to you, let you uh, start your presentation, feel free to, uh, to share uh, a little bit of your background first and what you kind of grew up uh, in as an environment. Great. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, we're gonna have a great session. I know, Gary, you're gonna add in some of your insight as well, which is always valuable. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know what, this is a really well timed uh, presentation if you ask me with what's going on in the marketplace. Number one thing everybody's talking about clearly is COVID. But number two is debt. And for any parents right now that got your kids to watch this presentation, I commend you. This is one of the best acts of leadership that you can have as a parent because you, you have a little more dirt under your nails. You understand the value of financial literacy and you know how important it is to make money. And uh, it's interesting because I interviewed Robert Kiyosaki earlier this week from Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I, I saw a video uh, of him that went back maybe about a year ago. And I asked him this question in the interview. He said, uh, poverty is passed on. And he said, one of the best things, the challenges when you look at generations of family not building wealth, it's usually because they're not educated properly. And if you're taking the time right now to teach your kids about it, this is one of the most valuable lessons that you will ever learn because any students watching right now, it doesn't matter what path you want to take, whether you want to start a charity, whether you want to be an employee, you want to be a doctor, lawyer, you want to run your own business. There's one constant that will always be in effect, and that is you will have to make money. Uh, because you have to pay bills. you got to put food on your plate, you know, roof over your head, clothes on your back, right? So that's why this is such an important thing. And the challenge is, in most cases, we're not taught about money. Uh, finally, most uh, governments are starting to be aware of this. Most corporations and unions and they're adding financial literacy as part of their presentation. But the problem is most financial literacy is really dry. Uh, it's not fun. It's not entertaining. It doesn't really 
uh, resonate with students. They get bored. I've been through that. We're speaking to students and five minutes into the presentation, they put their headset on and they fall asleep with drool coming out of their mouth because they're not really talking to students the way the students want to be talked to. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because, you know, we have students in our program that are 17 years old that bought their, just bought their sixth investment property, not one, two, three, six, six investment property by 17 years old out of London, Ontario. Right. What a cool story that is. So we're going to be talking about his story. And, you know, we have students in the program that are 13, 14 years old that are invested in the stock market. And we're going to teach parents how to set that up for their kids as well. So we got really a lot of cool stuff uh, that, again, that you're never going to learn anywhere else other than here. So we're pretty excited about it. Uh, for the parents listening right now, I'm not trying to scare you, uh, but I'm just trying to tell you why this is so important. If you look at it, this is a study done by Royal Bank last year. Uh, February 28, 2019, it says this, nearly 50% uh, of nearly half of parents still financially support their kids into their 30s. Think about that. So if you want to break it down even more, what the article says, it says this, it says the survey results found that a whopping 96% said they still financially support their children age 18 to 35 in some capacity with an average of $5,600 a year in financial support. If you break it down, 50% are still financially subsidizing their children, ages 30 to 35, spending an average of $3,700 annually, 69% on living expenses, 65% for cell phone bills, uh, and so forth. Sorry, 65% for mortgage and rent, 69% for educational costs, 58% for cell phones. So you can see, I know, I know there's parents right now watching going, that's me, or I'm on that path. And that's the whole point of Enrich Academy is to avoid students becoming a victim of this and living with their parents till they're 50. Uh, you take a look at it. This is another just scary stat. Parents delayed their retirement to help kids with post-secondary costs. 32% indicate helping their millennial children with post-secondary costs uh, is slowing or will slow their ability to pay off debt and retire. Uh, for students listening right now that are planning to go to college or university uh, and getting a student loan, you take a look at the stats. It's, it's astonishing. In the last year alone, roughly $150 million in student loans here in Canada were defaulted on. Uh, in the last seven years altogether, the last three years is 750 million. Wow. Uh, you look at default rates uh, Canada wide for student loans is, uh, sorry, in Ontario is 20%, uh, Canada wide is 13%. We're allowing students to borrow $15,000, $20,000 of student loan, which is not a problem, but we're allowing to borrow that money without any idea how to pay it back. Like I have three kids. I, have, I put them in hockey last year. Right. And to, before I put them in hockey, I had to watch a video for two hours on how to parent in a hockey arena. Don't hit the coach. Right. Don't scream at the refs like really basic stuff. But they won't allow me to register my kids in hockey till I got this certificate. And it should be illegal for students to get any money whatsoever uh, in student loans uh, until they take a test to pass to understand the responsibilities of money. Students right now watching that have a student loan, you got to realize this is the stuff that we hear. Students will get $10,000 in student loan, but they only need $7,000. Guess what most students do with that extra 3,000 bucks? Hello, Cuba, Mexico, they go on vacation with it. Like, I don't know, I haven't made that back for years, right? Yeah. But, or, or they think if I don't pay off my student loan, that doesn't affect my credit rating, right? Yeah. Or they go, I got good grades. I don't, have to, I, I, I don't have to pay off my student loan. I got good grades. And just to be clear, you will have to pay your student loan off. And if you don't, it'll affect your credit rating in a horrible way. And if your credit rating's messed up, you want to buy a car, you want to buy a home one day, you want to rent a house, good luck. You won't be able to with a bad credit rating. Right? Okay, well, I'll just jump in there. Uh, Warren, Warren Buffett, and for a lot of the uh, kids on this uh, program right now, we'll know of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett this year is, I think, the fourth richest individual in the world over the years. He has been you know, the richest man in the world, doesn't own a computer, but uh, early on, and he is a disciple and, you know, made his first investment at 11 or 12 years old. And we're going to talk about that, I think, today. But, you know, he has gone on public for, you know, 50 years now saying that your credit rating is more important than the cash, you know, that you can create or build. It is the most important thing. So, you know, understanding about that and the impact of credit ratings um, and the early mistakes that you can make and the catastrophic damage that it could have for your future and how long it takes to, you know, to fight and get out of, of that damaging position. Uh, is absolutely incredible. So children, first lesson, right? Guard your credit rating with your life. It is so important. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. 
Yeah, well, you're 100% right, because the reality is, is that most students go bad credit rating. Who cares? Because they don't understand the consequence of those actions. And if you want to borrow money to buy a car, because to build wealth and retire, you usually have to involve debt, getting a mortgage for a home, buying a car. It costs money to borrow that, or you got to borrow money. It costs money to borrow. And so student debt uh, is a really big issue in Canada. And governments are starting, we're lobbying governments right now uh, to say, take our course before uh, giving a dollar out to any student, because you know what, and build the pro price of the program into the into the debt. So we're saying instead of giving the students a $15,000 student loan, give them a $15,020 uh, loan and build our program into it. Uh, and it's no cost to the taxpayer. If we affect default rates by even 1%, we're going to make that money back 10 times over. Plus, on top of that, those students will be able to start their lives uh, and kickstart and, and, uh, and be way more effective citizens, which is great. Uh, this is the more important things that why we want to teach mo this money management is number one financially uh, why teaching kids uh, about financial literacy is so important financial independence early in life is critical i wish i would have seen this program when i was younger there's no doubt about it i was over twenty thousand dollars in debt two years after finishing high school for the students watching right now i didn't go to college university after school i'm not an advocate that you should or shouldn't do that but i think too many students do go to school thinking that that's going to kind of solve all their problems I think there's a place for, for college or university. It's not a one size fits all, that's for sure. By learning about money management, and I know students wanna know this too, they'll help you move out of your house sooner. Like how, how great is that? Uh, avoid delayed retirement for the parents. And these are critical skills uh, for future success that you, they, you just won't learn anywhere else. So here's the best, one of the interesting things is that anybody who's 13, 14, 15, or 16, 17 right now, you don't even know why you need to know money management. You're like, I go to work, I, I have a job and I make some money and I buy stuff on the weekend that I want to. Why, who cares? Because your parents are covering all the bills and your worst case money scenario might be, hey, I owe my friend 50 bucks because I borrowed it and I, I can't pay them back. Can you give me 50 bucks? And your parents are like, yeah, here's 50 bucks, get rid of them. But what happens between the ages of 17 and 25 is unbelievable when it comes to money, right? Because now you start getting credit cards and you're getting balances of two, three, four thousand dollars student loan debt at 20 or 30,000. And most parents don't have two or three thousand dollars sitting in a bank account to pay off uh, your credit card debt. That's why you need to know about this. But a lot of students are 15, 16, like, ah, like, I don't need to know about this, right? Now you're going to start realizing why you need to know about this. So we're going to go through a four step system here on getting a job, opening up the right accounts, creating a money system and get them, get them investing, um, which is great. So first thing I'm going to ask all students to do here is this, is you got to get a job. And I know Gary, I want to talk to you about this really quickly. As soon as I've done this is that Getting a job is critical. I hear a lot of kids saying, well, I don't want to affect my, my, my marks. I've read five different studies saying students with jobs actually get better marks uh, because they're committed. And we're going to talk about it's not what you make, it's what you take, and that's important. And you can start working as early as 13 years old here in Canada. Uh, why don't you talk about what you did there, uh, Gary, growing up? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll sort of jump in. So, you know, I call my mom my accidental mentor because I was, you know, raised in a, in a regular family. Uh, my mom and dad divorced very young when I was a young boy and my stepdad uh, came along uh, and just by necessity, I mean, they, they, they worked, you know, their tails off. I mean, my mom always had a full-time job and always had a part-time job and was always cleaning on the weekends and doing other stuff. So, you know, she was my accidental mentor because I had the good fortune of, of seeing the value that she put on hard work. She thought that hard work, you know, with, you know, children, um, you know, paid uh, substantial dividends. And, and, you know, a lot of parents say, well, I'm not sure if my parent, if my son or daughter should get a part-time job, I'm not sure that it's good for them. And I don't want them to go through what I had to go through. And in my opinion, that's exactly opposite. What a part-time job does for, you know, any child is it builds confidence. It builds self-esteem, uh, things like self uh, reliance. It gives them a, an early sense of responsibility. Um, and, and to your comment, Kev, uh, I've, I've also seen several studies that it actually shows that teams with part-time jobs actually get higher uh, test exams, uh, do higher, uh, uh, better in school. And sometimes it, it sparks lifelong careers. I mean, a young, young man gets a job as a busboy in a restaurant and, you know, all of a sudden owns a chain of restaurants down the road. Um, and it early, you know, helps you kind of build relationships. So, you know, for me, I had a part time job. My first job was a paper boy. And, and then I was folding boxes for Big M Donuts. Um, 
you know, that was terrible because every day after work, I brought home a dozen donuts and, you know, my struggle with uh, my weight uh, started when I was a kid, probably. <laughs> but, you know, nonetheless, I, I power washed, you know, trays. Um, I went out and I cut neighbors, you know, lawns. I, I shoveled snow, um, you know, and, and it didn't, you know, looking back now, I mean, I think it was a pivotal foundation for, you know, sort of who I was. Um, so, you know, I always say to, I always say to, to parents today, you know, encourage your, your children to get part-time jobs. I mean, both my kids had part-time jobs, you know, my son very early on. And, you know, I look at, at them today and, and they had a, they had a, they had the advantage of, of us kind of being the accidental mentor as well. So, you know, that's very important, um, you know, to open that up and give them the opportunity and, you know, and kids, I got to tell you, it is way cooler than eventually getting a truck with big tires and wheels right you know having your own home right at 19 or 20 you're buying your first home at 22 or 23 it is way cooler saying that you own stock in the keg or coca-cola as a 15 or 16 year old rather than going to 7-eleven and buying a big big gulp and a and a kit kat so we're going to talk about some of that today 100 percent. and i also think gary if you would agree just going in and we're going to talk about job interviews here in a second but just there's nothing more uh more freedom than being, I was always in my high school, the, the kid that had money. I always had two jobs going at once. To be honest, in, in school, I had a lunchtime job across the street as a lunch monitor at a, a, when I was in high school. Uh, I'd go across the street and I was making $15 an hour, which was huge when I was younger. Uh, you're talking 20 years ago. Wow. And, and I'd go across the street, work during lunch, and get paid 15 bucks a day just to watch kids in a playground, right? Which is pretty cool. Uh, but what we're gonna talk about here is all the money you receive is not yours. This is one of the most important, actually, for any student right now listening and parent, because most parents need this lesson as well. If you bring in a dollar, it's not all yours, right? This is the most basic money management lesson I think people can understand. Uh, one thing we're gonna talk about is taxes. I love this quote by Bill Murray, because kids don't really understand taxes. and I love Bill Murray said this. He said, the best way to teach your kids about taxes is by eating 30% of their ice cream. Uh, <laughs> I did that to my son last night just for fun. I ate 50% though. Uh, <laughs> he had a good job. I, yeah, I said that. And he was pissed, right? And rightfully so. Uh, but uh, you know what? I had, I, you know, I, I just, it's an interesting way to do it. But I do like that quote. Uh, for the students listening right now, this is one of the most valuable lessons we're going to talk about here today. And I'm telling you, when we do our live events and we speak in front of thousands of people every year, this is the lesson out of all lessons that means everything. It's not what you make, it's what you bring in. And let me show you what I mean. Will Smith is one of the top movie stars of all time. Before being in movies, he was in television. Before television, what launched his career, he was a rapper. Back in the 80s, he was a rapper. That's what kickstarted Will Smith's uh, career. And I love this quote by Will Smith. He said, I made my first million by the time I was 18. But the problem is I spent my first two million by the time I was 19. Think about that. He made a million dollars in his first year as a rapper. But by the time a year went by, he spent that full million and he went and spent another, another million. And so he's two million. He, like it was crazy. He was a million in debt. So did he have a money making issue? No, he had a spending issue. That was his problem. I was just watching a video on Shaq. Right, Shaq O'Neal, the uh, the basketball player, he said he got a million dollar bonus within three days. He was eighty thousand dollars in debt. Right, three days, and it's interesting because the first three seasons of Fresh Prince of Bel Air, he was two point eight million dollars in debt. Had to take the bus to work. He actually did a podcast on this recently. You can Google or go to YouTube and watch and, and type in Will Smith podcast, and he'll talk about it. Brink of bankruptcy, not because he didn't make money, because he wasn't good at managing the money he had. Six out of 10 NBA players are under financial distress five years uh, after uh, after retiring. 78% of NFL players within two years of retirement. Uh, more major league baseball players file for bankruptcy four times higher than the national average. And here's the problem, and Gary and I talked about this yesterday. Students go, I don't make millions of dollars, not my problem. Here is the reality is I run into students, we'll do these events across the country, and I'll have a classroom full of students. There'll be 50 of them there. And I'll ask, how many people have a job? And guess what? But a half the hands will go up. So about 50 people in the room, 25 of them have a job. And I'll point one out. I'll never forget this a few years ago. I said, what's your name? He goes, Darren. I go, Darren, let's say you work for me at McDonald's and you make $150 a week. Guess what most students do with that $150 a week? And we all know the answer. Most students spend all of it. And I said, okay. I said, well, let's say Darren works for me at McDonald's and he's the best mopper here in Toronto. 
I mean, he mops floors like crazy. Like people all around Toronto area come in to look at his floors because they're so clean. And I realized across the street, A and W has been eyeballing Darren's mopping skills. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to lose uh, Darren because he's so valuable as a mopper. And I say, you know what? Instead of paying Darren $150 a week. I'm going to pay him $200 a week. I'm going to give him a raise. Guess what most students will do with that extra 50 bucks, Gary? They're going to wind it. Spend it. So whether they make $150, $200 a week, it's amazing. I'd be in this classroom with 50 students in the room. 25 of them have a job. It's not like all those 25 made the exact same amount of money every week. Some made $75 a week. Some made $100 a week. Some made $300 a week. But like 90% of them had no money. Mm. And I sat there and I said, and here's what students think. They're like, well, when I get older and graduate university and go from, you know, 150 a week to a thousand a week, that's when I'll start saving money. Here's the best way I can take a look at it. If you don't learn the habit here at $150 a week, giving you more money will not help you save more money. That is the biggest myth when it comes to students and money. The most valuable lesson you will get that's worth more than any return on any stock you're going to get is realize that every dollar you make is not all yours. You've got to put some of it away. And here's the best analogy I give you. I can give anybody. If people go, well, you know what? I'll make more money. That'll solve my problem. If you can't save any money out of $150, you won't save any money out of 200. It's like going to the gym and I'm asking you to lift 150 pounds and you can't. It gets too heavy. If you can't lift 150 pounds, you think you can lift 200 pounds. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just had a conversation with Brian McGratton from the Calgary Flames last week, and we were talking about NHL players and money. And I said, it's amazing how many NHL players I've met work, worked with after their career, and they make a million dollars a year on average, and they have a higher net worth than other players in the league that made $5 million a year. Yeah. Do you know how many plumbers have come to our program, Gary, and they make 90000 a year, and they're worth more than lawyers that make half a million a year? Mm -hmm. All the time. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. But the problem is where some reason, and I am too, we are, I think you have to rewire your head in this, is that you have to realize what you make is not what you're worth. And the best thing you can do, we're going to talk about the value of saving money later on in this presentation, but you've got to realize making more money is not the solution to saving more. you got to learn how to live within what you're making right now. I love this. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday, Gary. This is the best copy I could get of it is that this is Jay-Z. And Jay-Z is a really smart individual, one of the best business people in the world. And he said this. He said, on the left-hand side, sorry, not, I didn't say this. On the left-hand side, you'll see a picture with him, all this jewelry and all this, you know, uh, you know, uh, branded clothing. And he said, uh, so this representation is one of the best lessons I could share with you. On the left, he's worth $100,000. On the right, he's worth six hundred million. Do you see a difference? Can I make a comment on that, Kev? Absolutely, Gary. Boy, this is just so important, right? I mean, you know, as as kids today and young teens, there's this immense pressure, right, to be popular and to look good, and you know, we all want to wear the brands and the fancy stuff, and you know, it's about coming into our own. But I promise you, as I said earlier. You know, what's way cooler and gives you, you know, way more popularity is is you, you know, being self-reliant and having a job and earning money. And and as I said, we're going to talk about it. But, you know, um, just, you know, like getting away from, you know, always worrying about what somebody else thinks. If there's one lesson that I can, you know, um, give to all of you, it's just like it doesn't matter what you do. Right. People are always going to have an opinion and that's OK. Right. But your opinion on yourself and the confidence that you get by having a, you know, a job earlier and saving money, the joy that you get every single month looking at your bank account and seeing that it's up 15 or $20 or $80 or $100 and seeing that compound over time. And all of a sudden you look back and you're 22 or 23 years old. And I'm going to give some examples here today. And, you know, you have this immense confidence about you. You can have, you know, all the things that, you know, you thought were important. The wealthy barber, David Chilton, was my guest a few weeks ago. And, and kids, this is really important to you guys. He said to me that it is statistically proven that people that have more stuff are less happy. It isn't the stuff that makes you happy. It isn't the brand, right? You know, it's the freedom that you get, the independence, the relationship. So, you know, just make sure that you think, you know, and remind yourself constantly. It isn't about the stuff. Those guys who have to, like, show off their stuff are, you know, usually the guys don't have any stuff, right? They're all facade. Yep. I agree with you 100%. And it's about 
just trying to find that balance act. And we're going to be talking about that as Gary just alluded to as well, is this right here, just give you a perfect example. But sometimes we got to go through the maturity and growing up and spending money, but we're going to talk about that as we go through. Uh, for those of you that don't have a job and are trying to find one, I'm telling you right now, let's, let's just talk about what you're not going to learn anywhere else is finding a job interview. You've got to be able to nail it. Like, first of all, you got to be super persistent. Right. Thank you notes. I've got this right here from Gary. You know, Gary's here, the guy that practices what he preaches. I write thank you notes all the time. They're some of the most valuable things you can do and you can be absolutely different. My daughter and I, uh, you know, the challenge is when you go in for a job at McDonald's and or Wendy's or wherever it is, you got to realize you're competing against 300 other resumes and all the resumes are going to have something that I have. I've been babysitting for five years. I've got my black belt in Taekwondo. Uh, you know what? I, I was the president of my uh, club in school and you're going to try to, you know what? Make your, uh, that's what, how most students think that your uh, resume is going to pop ahead of everybody else. But the challenge is think about a resume stack, 300, you know, pieces of paper. Let me see if I can have, like, uh, I didn't bring it. Anyway, 300 pieces of paper just stacked up. Something like that is not going to make any difference whatsoever. It might a little bit, but at the end of the day, it won't. It's the persistence. It's writing that thank you note and dropping it off the day after you do the interview and saying, hey, just want to let you know, here's my thank you note. I know you have a big you know, a lot of opportunity or a lot of choices to make here. I really think I can separate myself from the competition. I had one student that watched our program and was so inspired by being different. And he applied for a job at McDonald's. What he did, he created a quick website and had him making burgers at his house and flipping them and putting him, you know, on, like making burgers with his family. And he got the job. Yeah. Another student really quickly tried to get a job at a Kelsey's restaurant and couldn't get it because he didn't have uh, job experience as a server. So guess what he did? He went home that night and took a takeout menu and stuck. So he got rejected by the manager saying, yeah, we can't hire you. We're looking for people with just experience in waiting uh, that have waiter experience. So he takes the takeout menu, studies all the toppings and goes back the next day and says, I know you said I can't get the job, but I studied your menu. I know every topping on every burger, every sauce on every pasta. Give me a shot. Test me. If I pass, would you consider hiring me? And they hired them right on the spot. And that is how you separate yourself from the competition. Can I add to that, uh, Absolutely, Kev? Absolutely, Gary. So I was always one of those kids from a very young age, you know, at any age, I could just go out and just knock on doors and come back and get four or five jobs in a day or offers. And, you know, really for me, it was about being communicative and, and always being really appreciative and, and polite. And uh, two stories I want to share. A lot of my early jobs when I was a kid got offered to me because, you know, early on, I somehow recognized that I got great validation and I got great response from people by being a little bit different than all my kids. So when I would call my buddy, Sean Kelly, at the Kelly residence, and I'm talking when I was 11, 12 years old, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, I would call and I would go, hi, Mrs. Kelly, it's Gary Morris calling, sorry to bother you, but is Sean available, please? And she used to go, well, oh my God, Gary, you're so polite. And, you know, at, at high school, grade eight, the most coveted thing was the corner store. We'd go up and get Slurpees because I was nice every day. I made an effort. Hi, how are you? Good morning. You know, I don't know where it came from, but I recognized early on by being a little more communicative rather than just grunting, right? You know, that people recognized uh, you and, and, you know, and gave you opportunities. Well, that first year in grade eight, the owner of the store, his name was Bing said to me, do you have another job? And I'm in grade eight, right? So I said, well, I actually I did, but I said, no, not, not it. I said, what are you, what are you thinking about? And he goes, well, I need someone to control only four kids maximum in the store at lunch hour, right? And I just really, you seem like a really nice boy. And you know what, that was it. I was nice, no skills. He had 700 kids in that school that all went to that store, you know, during the course of the week at lunchtime. And he chose me because I was nice. And I mean, I was the bouncer. I was the Slurpee King right? Deciding who went in. And it was funny because when I took my son out, one day I said, Cole, it's time to get a job. And I put him in the front seat of my truck and I helped him write his resume and, you know, all this, anything that he had done, we put on there, what he did in sports. And, but we wrote a cover letter for him and it was just enough to stand out. And the cover letter on the front of the resume, and I just was speaking to him this morning, we had a good laugh about it. But the cover letter basically said, Right. I promise you that I will be the best hire you ever made. I will show up early. I will stay late. I will always be positive. I'll never call in sick on a sunny long weekend, you know, because it's uh, a nice day. Right. And I'll work incredibly hard. Right. And then when it said education, you know, and in this case, he was grade 11 or something. Right. PhD in what results. 
right? Like just have some fun with it. Say something that's going to be different. You know, a lot of us want to be like so serious and we take it, we think it's, you know, like being nice and having fun, right? And following up and sending that, that card with meaningful words will open so many doors for you. It's incredibly easy. And I literally took, took Cole out and I put him in the front seat of my car and we went out to, I don't know, 10 or 12 restaurants. He was looking to become a, a busboy, you know, in his early teens. And I think within inside of a week, he had four job offers and he ended up working at Milestones for years and years and years. Absolutely. And when you want to drop those notes off, like Gary's alluding to, I can, sometimes I, I hear students and parents, they call me after we're going through one of these programs and they're like, is it okay if I just drop it off if the manager's not there the next day? No, you want to make sure the manager's there. That second contact face to face, shaking their hand, nice firm handshake for any student watching right now that will make or break. Even when you're older, you can tell their confidence by just a nice, strong handshake eye to eye contact saying, mm. I wrote this thank you note. I really appreciate it. If you want to have fun if you're applying, <laughs> if you're going for a job at McDonald's, the student did this, all these stories you have. He actually gave, uh, one student gave a certificate to McDonald's to the manager of McDonald's. And another one, if you want to have a lot of fun is uh, get, a, get a Wendy's gear certificate, like for Wendy's food or Harvey's and uh, give it to the McDonald's manager and say, I hear the food here is great. Right? <laughs> That's how you separate yourself from the competition. These aren't my ideas. This is all the stuff that we hear back from students. And that's what's going to separate yourself because now you become creative the older you get. And then the, it's no different when you're applying for a job when you get older. Uh, you've got, you know, you're going up against a lot of competition. And a lot of the time it's the personality that breaks through mm. more than what it says in the words in the resume. Well, and my daughter just popped on the screen there. Uh, hi, honey. I wasn't sure if you were on today because I know you're at work, but uh, you must have a really good employer. Uh, anyway, she just popped up and she goes, dad, you, you, you helped me write the exact same letter, right? There it is right there. Uh, Dave just put it up again. And you know, which I did. And it's, it's just the little things that stand out, right? You know, and, and I can't, I can't, you know, overestimate the power of really trying not to, to grunt, trying to be communicative, right? Like, you know, kids today, they answer the phone at home or now they text and everything and one word answers and how are you? I'm fine. Right. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm great. I'm wonderful. You know what I mean? Couldn't be better. Like people love that. They love positive attitude, right? And it's it's those little things that make, you know, that make such a huge difference in the opportunities you're going to see in your life. Uh, there's another idea that I had. Again, these things just keep popping up. And these are for students, again, if you're trying to apply for a job at McDonald's or any fast food or whatever you want, is that the student sent a bouquet of balloons the next day, like just loud, and just said that whatever, I can't remember the student's name, like, you know, Gary Morris really wants this job. And it's just so bulky, right? <laughs> like the manager has to look at it, right? And just if somebody's willing to go that extra little step and spend 20, 30 bucks on balloons and just this big obnoxious uh, presentation, that really does pop. And that's what's going to look better. That, And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a good resume and participate in clubs. That's all great. But the challenge, again, when you're competing against two or 300 different resumes, everybody's going to have their different little thing, right? So how do you have one extra little thing than everybody else? And I also want to, I want to remind the kids too, you know what, like, so I, guys, I was a, I wasn't a great student, right? I had, you know, a hard time paying attention. You know, I was a sort of a C, C plus student. You know, I think I had one B, you know, in all my, my years of school. So it doesn't, you know, if you're listening to this right now and you go, you know, I'm not a great student, you know, I'm not, I'm not an A student, you know, and you think for some reason that's going to restrict you in any way, I promise you it's not. It's all about your energy and it's all about your passion and it's all about your communication skills. You know, it's funny because my son and, and when he was 17 or 18 and his really good buddy, Brendan, wanted to start their own business. And of course, you know, I really wanted to encourage him. So I said, write a letter. I said, I'll give you the names and phone numbers and emails of all of my friends, everyone we've met, all of mom's friends, right? And he wrote a letter and he sent it to all of my friends, right? He mailed it to him. He emailed it to him and it just said, hey guys, I'm Cole, sort of bother you. This has nothing to do with my, with my dad, with Gary. But, you know, I wanted to let you know, me and Brendan are starting a company. We'll pressure wash, we'll read, we'll do landscaping, you know, we'll remove junk and dirt, anything you want. And I promise you, I'll show up, I'll work hard, I'll do way more than was ever expected, right? Like, please, if you give me an opportunity, it would mean a lot to me. And I had, I don't know, he had, they had 15 or 20 jobs in the queue with inside of like four or five days, just friends that you know, that had come through, um, you know, and had saw and knew they were a nice kid and knew they would work hard. But, you know, he just did something that was different. He asked and he was nice and polite. You, I, I, again, it's if you can have this perfect synergy between 
good marks showing up, nice resume and a little extra pop, you will get that job. And one of the things that you also want to do, Gary, and I know, you know, you're a huge advocate of this. There's a great saying, it's a challenge in school and school is great. And I'm not discounting it, <laughs> but it's really good. Uh, but you're rewarded for being like smart, you know, like the challenge I ran into, and there's some students listening are very smart, which is great. That's amazing. And, but you're on the honor roll and you really try to fit on the honor roll. If you don't hit the honor roll, you think you're not destined for any success because you didn't make it on this honor roll. And there's a great saying, they say, if you're the smartest person in your company, you've made a mistake. Uh, and, and it's true. Uh, and one of the best things any student can do, and I don't care how old you are, uh, you want to find mentors in your life. And I've had many, Gary being one, uh, Chris Cade, his partner. Mentors are going to be a little bit older than you. Uh, my mentor that got me really on the right path was a guy by the name of Richard Robbins. How I met him, he was a real estate agent out of Markham, Ontario. Picked up a phone book, book when there used to be phone books uh, and a telephone book. And I actually called 60 real estate agents and offered to work for free for any of them. And I said, I'll do whatever you want. I'll fetch, you know, coffee. I'll, I'll do the trash. Just give me a shot. I want to become a real estate agent. 59 real estate agents said no, only one called me back and it was this guy. And he's willing to spend time with me every couple of weeks uh, reading books and telling me what to read. Uh, and next thing you realize, six months later, he's starting a brand new company called Richard Robbins International. And I was 21 years old and I was a mechanic making me 30000 a year. Uh, by the time I was 25 after meeting him and we started this company, I was making over $250,000 a year because a mentor is like the answers to the test. You're not allowed to cheat in school. You can't look at the answers to the test. You got to take the test and then they give you the answers. A mentor is like a cheat book for, for all the answers to life in a lot of cases, right? And he was the answers to a lot of it. And then I met Gary and Chris. They, they're older than me. A lot of answers. And I want to show you, this is a perfect example. We had a student that watched Enriched Academy. It's this guy right here, Arian Beza. This is him. He's 16 years old, uh, 17 years old, excuse me, at the time. He watched Enriched Academy. He sent me a 20-minute video on what he liked about Enriched Academy, about 10 minutes on what he liked about it, 10 minutes what he didn't like about it, what he would do to make it better. It was really funny. <laughs> Which is great. It was great. I could totally take it. It was really funny. And then he's like, I'd like an opportunity to meet you. And we met with him. He goes, I really want to work with you. And we ended up bringing him on board for Enrich Academy. He's 24. By the time he's 21 years old, he's making over $125,000 a year. And the reason why is that he has mentors such as myself and Jay, who've learned off people like Gary on this call right now and Chris and Rich. He's absorbing all of this information. And I mean, this guy works night and day. I get emails and texts at Saturday night at 1 in the morning saying, hey, I got this great idea. Can you chat? It's 1 in the morning on Saturday. And that's what it takes. And I'm just telling you right now, I, we've had thousands of students watching Rich Academy. We have so many successful stories. But if I ever got a video of any student watching our program and they were inspired, we'll hire you right now. I'm telling you right now, if you're this good, I'll hire you. And mm -hmm. you know what? if you're willing to do what we tell you to do, you're going to do very well financially. And on top of that, have a fairly decent balance in your life, which is great. One of the most important things when it comes to success is punctuality, right? Imagine Gary and I just showed up on this call right now. You guys would be pretty pissed off. I love <laughs> the thing, right? If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're forgotten. If you're working McDonald's, Wendy's, any fast food restaurant, and your shift starts at, let's say, 5 p.m., uh, 5 o'clock, show up at 4.30. Start doing stuff. It matters. It creates a habit and a People work. are watching. 100% they are. Show up early, leave late. Can I help? Anything I can finish off? You do that, you will never worry about money ever in your life. The next, sorry, go ahead. Anything, Gary? Sorry, I was, was going to make one, one, one point. You know, we get stuck in a society today where people just say, do what you do, what you love, find something you love and follow your passion, and you'll never work a day in your life. And I was on another call this morning and I said, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, find what you're interested in and what you love, no question. But sometimes you got to do the shit jobs too. You got to get your hands dirty. You have yep. to prospect. You have to go out. You have to work late. You know, like hard work is going to define who you are. So embrace the suffering. Embrace the hard work, right? It isn't all like, you know, peaches and cream and butterflies and rainbows, right? You're going to have to do a lot of things as a young guy that are going to be really hard on you. And you're going to be really tired. And you're going to be really sweaty and really dirty, but do it well.
right? And do it better than anyone expected. And people around you, mom and dad and friends of mom and dads and parents and on the sports team, they're going to see the way you operate and they're going to offer you so much opportunity and it will happen. I promise you guys, but you got to know that it takes some grit. It takes some work. You got to commit. Nothing's free. You know, success, you know, doesn't just happen. You don't just get older and all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're successful with this beautiful life and holidays and, and some extra money and, you know, all of your goals, right? You have to chase success. It is a result of your actions and your hard work. If you plan it, you will get it. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Gary. And again, here's a, a guy who's a mentor. And I know Gary would be the same. If you saw somebody with a tenacity and energy, you would bring them on because they're a valuable asset in any way that you want. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And showing up early and doing what you need to do, that stuff really matters and it costs nothing. It, it's nothing. It costs zero to do that. Uh, before I forget, uh, Gary and I have a big announcement. We're going to give away some pretty cool stuff for those that uh, I see everybody staying here. Anyway, we're at the end of this, we're going to give uh, uh, something away, which is really cool, uh, to 10 people. Uh, the next thing you want to do, now that you have a job and we're teaching how to do it, the next thing is you got to start opening up the right accounts. So students that I meet with and work with, the majority of them just have a checking account. What you want to do is you want to have a checking and a savings account. Now, at Enrich Academy, don't we don't advocate you know what banks to open up or not? We, it doesn't matter. It doesn't it doesn't matter where you want to go. But what you want to do is open up a checking and a savings account at any credit union or bank that you work with. Plus, you also want to open up an investment account, which we'll talk about. Now, again, we have no affiliation with these uh, banks or credit unions. None of them. Uh, I'm not recommending them. We've done our research. These tend to have the best rates and deals for students based on the research. Uh, there's no code here. Uh, CIBC, TD, and Tangerine seem to have the best checking and uh, savings account for students. The best investment accounts uh, that we have found that exist are Quest Trade, Scotia I Trade, and, and Q Trade. Now, this is where it gets interesting: is how do you create a strong money system? So, for students working right now, you have money from a job. All your money, and I'm going to show you a graph here that you make, you're probably getting paid weekly or biweekly, a check or direct deposit. You want to make sure all your money goes into your checking account. Then what you want to do is transfer 10 to 40% of that uh, from a checking account to your investment account each month to invest, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes how to do. And then you want to take out 10% every six months from, chair, uh, from your checking to give to charity. So to make it as simple and easy as possible, this is what, and you want to automate the process because any bank or credit union can help you do this. So you have your job, all your money from your job goes into your checking account, okay? Into your checking account. Then what you're going to do is 10 to 40% of that money you earn every month will get transferred into an investment account, into an investment account, and 10% will go into charity every six months. A lot of people go, why am I giving to charity? One of my favorite books, it's right It's right there. Uh, where is it? Somewhere on my bookshelf, there's tons of books. Oh, here it is. <laughs> I want to get it. The Automatic Millionaire. I'm chasing this guy down right now for an interview. David Bach, the guy was on Oprah, so you know he's good. In this book, they interview 100 millionaires and how they became millionaires. And they all have a different story. You know, whether it's real estate, running their own business, whatever. Uh, and they all had a different story how they became millionaires, but there was one consistent story out of all of them. And guess what? They all had one thing in, uh, in common. And guess what it was? They all gave to charity. And guess when they gave to charity? Before they were millionaires. Right? And a lot of people say, I I'm telling you, ask anybody who's wealthy, giving starts the receiving process. Whatever you believe in, it could be, you know, a uh, humane society, whatever it may be, it does not matter. I am telling you, do nice things, and nice things will come back at you all the time, right? Gary, can I just uh, jump in there? When when Kev talks about, so, you know, the wealthy barber, uh, for any of you kids, David Chelton, uh, ask your mom or dad to uh, talk to you about that book and uh, get it ordered for yourself. But it talks about paying yourself first. So, you know, what many people do, unfortunately, is they they work, they get a paycheck, and then they, you know, spend their money and they invest whatever they have left over. Right. What you have to do is get a paycheck, take 10 to 15 percent of that paycheck and invest it and then spend whatever you have over. You have to. The basic principle is to pay yourself first. And it's interesting to get it into an investment vehicle that's not a checking account at a bank. Yeah, that's why you got to move it. Uh, to another account, you know, and the reason why we talk about stocks as an example 
is that you can put it into the stock market today. And for you kids, you're buying a little piece of, of a company. So, you know, rather than, than, you know, going out and blowing $50 on a weekend for $45 today, you can buy a share of Coca-Cola, right? And that, 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 that Coca-Cola stock will usually increase in value year after year after year after year and also pay you what they call a dividend or pay you interest on your money every single year. So now you don't have to work as hard. So if you have an extra $6 in your pocket right now, today, rather than going out this weekend and buying candy with it, say to mom and dad, I wanna invest it in Boston pizza stock. Wouldn't it be nice tomorrow to say, I own Boston pizza, right? Rather than spending that, you know, I used to say to my kids growing up, I hated frivolous like toys and little Pokemon stuff and all that, you know, it was like $4 a pack. And I just knew they were going to have no interest in three months from now. And we spent so much money. It used to drive me crazy. But you kids on this call right now, it is so much fun when you own pieces of businesses. You inside of the next year or two can say, I own a piece of Disney. I own a piece of Coca-Cola. I own a piece of Facebook. Now that's something to brag to your friends about. And just to be clear, I'm actually going to show you here in a few slides of how valuable and how fast this money can grow if you started at an early age. It's really amazing. It's crazy because this is the most important. And Gary just hit on it a bunch of times. I'm going to hit it on it again. You got to get investing. I love this quote by Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, who's one of the wealthiest people in the world, said, I made my first investment at the age of 11. I was wasting my life up until then. And I love that quote. And, you know, here's the reality of what you want to do. And this, I'm talking to all the parents right now that are listening with a child or a teen under the age of 18, you want to make sure that you set this up for your kids. Okay. There's three that I'm aware that do this. There may be more, uh, but again, I'm not recommending any of them. You can call it a custodial account. These are types of trusts that are specifically designed to hold and manage assets for a minor until they reach the age of majority. So you can open up a trading account in trust through you as the parent or guardian. And guess what? You can start buying stock under them, under, as you're the trust, under these. So Quest Trade opens up custodial accounts. Wealth Simple will do it, and TD does it. I have trading accounts for all my kids. I have a 13 year old. Sorry, 14 year old. I got a 12 year old and I got a nine year old. And all of them have been investing in the stock market for the last four or five years. And my 14 year old is clearly starting to get it now, right? My nine year old, not as bright. So, no, uh, my, <laughs> my nine year old is, you know, it's tough to get it through, but they're starting to get it. I'm not saying at nine they're going to be the next Warren Buffett. But what you're doing is you realize that. For the parents are like, well, I'll wait till my kid's 18, then they'll do it. Well, here's the problem. If you don't do it, they're going to go, well, I guess it wasn't that important, right? And yeah. I want to share a, a quick story on that, right, for, for kids because, you know, obviously you can – you can earn money and you can put it into these companies and buy pieces of these companies via the stock market, but you can also put it into anything you love. So I have a, a lifelong friend of mine. I've been, I've been hanging out with Rick for 40 years and his son Kyle is 22 years old and just bought his first condo, you know, 600 and some odd thousand dollars at 22 years old. And Kyle saved $125,000. Now he's worked part-time for years, you know, in a warehouse, but you know, what he actually did really well is he used, um, you know, social media, Craigslist, uh, sorry, not social media, Craigslist and, and Kijiji. And I know, Kev, you're going to show a video of another young man. Yeah. Um, but he, Kyle, loved fashion. He loved North Face and he loved Nike shoes, especially. And he would go on and scour, you know, the internet. And he would buy things anytime he thought that they were cheap. And he would ship it to his home. He would have it for a little while. He would clean them up. And then he would repost them again and sell them on other sites and be more descriptive in how he sold them. And he would buy something at $40 and he'd sell it for $60. He'd buy something at $85 and sell it at $175. He'd buy something at $200 and sell it at $500. And that was in addition to his part-time job. So all of a sudden, this young man, you know, at, at 22 years old has saved $125,000 by the age of 22. And he didn't, I mean, he was a miser with his money and you have to be a miser with your money because you got to make those sacrifices. But my goodness, that's going to set him up. He used to also go to like Safeway and save on foods and Costco and buy bulk candy 
and put them in bags and take them to school. Probably the teachers didn't like it. Not sure if you ever got caught or not. But then he used to sell candies of like keys and, and squishy candies and that sort of stuff. He just increased the price by buying in bulk. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do that. The other yeah. thing I want to make sure is that the book that Warren Buffett, actually, you know, a lot of people and authors over the years that have studied Warren Buffett and Warren himself, today the fourth richest man in the world, he had a book um, and it was called uh, A Thousand Ways to Make a Thousand Dollars. And it was originally written in the like 1930s. It was Warren Buffett's Bible and got him thinking about it. And today he's, uh, he's worth $70 billion. You can still download that book today. You can go, it's available by ebook uh, for sure. And I think there's still some paperback copies as well, but a thousand ways to make a thousand dollars. I just want you kids to start thinking about these ways and let your creative juices start flowing. I, yeah, hundred percent. And that's the whole thing. And that's why with this point right here, parents, this is a pain in the butt to do. Sometimes I've heard people go, I went to TV. They didn't really know what it is. Just to be clear, they do provide this. I know this because I'm doing it myself, but it is up to the parent to drag your kids saying, we're going to the bank, we're setting this up, we're well simple, we're going to get it done. It's one hour for the rest of their lives. So get this done because if you're not, you start losing your power if your kid's in their 30s and not saving any money. And that's why you've got to get them doing this. It's critical. That's why we need to lead them through this process. And this is stuff that I wish my parents did. I worked through it, as Gary did. I worked through all my high school, and I wish I would have saved money, and I can't even fathom what it would be worth now, right? And that's why it's so important. And this is just fluctuating numbers. Like, these stock prices won't be that accurate. But you look at it, you look at Apple, right? You know, that's trading. Disney, you can buy things that relate. That's people go, what I buy my kids. I buy them bank stock, things that they would know, Disney stock. Right. And and the reality is they've done very well with it. Right. Obviously, there's a well, so Apple Apple today right now is three hundred and twenty two dollars. So if you would have bought that last year at one ninety three, that single stock at one ninety three is now worth three hundred and twenty two dollars today. It's it's unbelievable. And this is where it really starts on making your kids understand why money and for every student watching right now, pay attention to this. This is critical. Look at this. Let's go back 100 years ago. Let's go back to the year 1920. So we're not we're in year 2020. We're going to go back 1920. Let's say if I gave you $100 100 years ago and you did a bunch of different things. So what would you do? If you put that $100 into a checking account because you're like, oh, I got a job and I have a checking account. Your checking account gives you no money to keep your money there. So they give you 0%. So that $100 today would be worth $100. If your money was sitting in a savings account, like, well, I'm saving money. Uh, and they're giving me a 1.5% return, uh, that $100 would be worth $443. If you wanted to buy something for $100 100 years ago, this is called inflation. So what would something cost you back 100 years ago? What would that exact same product cost you today? That same product would cost you $1,900 because the price of goods go up. So you're actually losing money with your money sitting in a checking and savings account. It's losing money. The, the banks love it and credit is like, yeah, keep it here. This is great because we're going to make a ton more money on it than you will. Bonds at a 5% return, that $100,000 will be worth uh, at a, uh, $13,000. $100. Yep. The $100 said not $100,000. Oh, sorry. The $100 will be worth uh, uh, $13,000. Real estate at a 6% return, that $100 will be worth $33,000. Look at stocks. The average return in the stock market for the last 110 years has been 8%. That is the ret average return. The hundred dollars we were two hundred and nineteen thousand dollars today. That's something that we call. Oh, the the best analogy I can give, and for any student listening right now, my daughter. This was my daughter's aha moment. And any parent right now who hasn't done this with their kids, play adult Monopoly. And when we were twelve, I do a daddy daughter weekend with each one of my kids every week every year. Go away for a couple of days. And one year we played Monopoly. It was a couple of years ago. And my daughter, she still she knew she was saving. Didn't really get the investing part. And we we're playing Monopoly, and guess what? She didn't want to buy anything. She wanted to save the money, and every time she passed go, she's like, give me my 200 bucks. She wanted the 200 bucks, but she's like, I'm going to save it. I'm like, well, you got to start buying stuff. She's like, no, I'm not going to buy anything, and I, I, I got to save my money. And so I kept buying stuff, and, you know, I kicked her butt the first game. And then she's stubborn. The second game, she's like, no, I'm going to keep – I'm going to stick with this. So she, she didn't buy anything. She just kept saving the money. She wouldn't buy anything, and then she lost again. The third game, she started to get it. She started investing her money, started buying property, started building houses, starting to building, and then she won the third game. Like legit, I didn't let her win. I don't, I don't do that. She actually won the third game. And for any student watching right now, can you win Monopoly without buying anything? 
You can't. It's impossible. And real life is no different. It's called compound interest. This right here is the secret to wealth. I love this. They say if you had a penny and doubled it each day uh, for 30 days, what would it be worth? So day one, you have a penny. And it's so funny. I'm going to set the foundation because I see people online. Uh, where are you going to get this kind of return? Yeah, let me know what bank does this. Yeah, this is not. We're just trying to make a point here. Okay. <laughs> You're not going to get this return. So uh, this is not real. Well, of course not real. But but the numbers are real. If you had a penny day one, by day 10, you'd have $5.10. A penny day one, two cents, four cents, eight, keep doubling it. By day so I'll show you that right there. By day 11, you have 10 cents, uh, ten dollars. Keep running the numbers. By day 20, you have five thousand. Right? Day one, one cent. Day 25,000. Take a look at day 25, 167,000. 335. By day 30, you have five million three hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars. This is the secret to wealth. Warren Buffett, which we've quoted to death, said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Those that earn it, those that understand it, earn it. Those that don't pay it. And those that don't understand it are paying compound interest on credit card debt. That's what we're talking about, right? And I'm going to show you. This is my daughter, Maya. I don't, I, you've seen any of my programs. She's, we don't promote her. I, I, it's not my thing here, but I want to give you an idea. This is her exact system, and she's practicing it. I give you my word. She got a job. She works at a senior residence in the town that I work at. She's a server for the during dinner time for the seniors. She brings a, she asks what they want, and she brings the food to them at the di in the dining area. She did the exact same thing. Applied for the job. About a hundred resumes came in. She went in the next day, did the thank you note, and this is this is what she makes. She was thirteen years old. She couldn't work. She couldn't get a job at McDonald's yet, but she found a job doing this. She makes 13 bucks an hour. She works 15 hours a week. She makes $195 a week. Monthly, she averages $780. Yearly, she makes 9,360 bucks. That's what she makes. Good girl. So it's great, right? And so how do we break this up? And I didn't add the taxes. And, and, and Gary, we didn't do this yesterday. So I couldn't get my art people on this. So this is just me doing it the best that I could do. So I apologize. Uh, but her total income is 9,360 every year. This is how my daughter, Maya, and any student listening right now can do this. She saves 40% of it. Now, I know somebody in their 20s can't do that, right? Because you're probably like, hey, I got to pay my bills. I got a car. I got to go out a little bit more. But somebody 13, 14, 15, or 16 should be able to do this. And I know I didn't take the taxes away. I don't I don't know exactly what the taxes were on this. So I just wanted to kind of give a rough. It won't be far off of this. So, yeah. so she saves $3,744 every year, 40%. It's not like it's all doom and gloom. I can't do anything. She spends 50% of her money. She spends nearly $5,000 a year on anything that she wants. I AirPods, if she wants a new pair of clothes or shoes, whatever. Go ahead. I don't tell her what to do with it. It's her money. She earned it, right? And she say, and she gives 10% of it away. She gives a couple thousand dollars away every year into charity. Now, let me show you why this is so powerful. I'm going to show you down here. She's 13 years old. She saved $3,744. At an 8% return, which I was telling you about, by the time she's 25, if the past represents the future, which at 110 years is a pretty good track record, by the time at an 8% return, she's 25, she'll have $9,747. By the time she's 45, that this 3,000, this is just one time. Oh, sorry about that. This is just one time. If she does this every year, the number's even better. 3,000 turns to 9,000. By the time she's 45, it's 48,000. By the time she's 60, 158,000. This $3,700 turned to $158,000. That's the power of compound interest. But the problem for students listening right now, all we see is instant gratification wealth. We're like, oh my gosh, Austin Matthews, that NHL player just signed a $110 million uh, contract and he's 23. That's how it's done. Oh my gosh, Justin Bieber made $200 million last year touring. Like that's not real wealth. That, that's real wealth. Excuse me. That's not <laughs> way 99.9999% of the wealth is created. And you look at a guy like Austin Matthews, he's been skating, you know, in arena since three years old. He moved out of his house at 15, hasn't lived there since then. So yeah, the guy has a 15 year career by the time he's 20. He's been doing it for 15 years. 
But a lot of students go, well, I'm 13. I don't want to do that. I want to spend and have fun. So I'm going to wait till I'm 25. Let me show you how powerful and how much money you lose by doing that. If you wait till you're 35, 25 years old to save the exact same amount of money, you're only going to have 3,700 bucks because now you're starting at 25. So you're already behind $6,000. 6,000 bucks behind, just like that. And what do you have to show for that 3,700 bucks? Like as, as Gary said, Pokemon, a bunch of stuff that we bought that we don't need and we don't ever use again. Stuff. By number 45, you're $29,000 behind because now that instead of having 48,000 because you started at 13, you only have 18,000. And by the time you're 60, you have 90,000 when you could add 158,000. That's $67,000 behind. And that's just one year. Imagine you put 3,700 in the next year. This would be near 20,000. This would be near 90,000. This would be near 300,000. That's how the wealthy get wealthy. That's what you should be doing right now. And divide your money up this way. And again, if you're in your early 20s, I get you may not be able to do 40%. At least do 10. But that's my that's absolute, is absolute minimum, 10 to 15%. Start today for the rest of your wealth and then never touch that money. Let the power of compound interest do its work for you. 100 We're only asking you to save 10 or 15%, guys. Right? The other 85% can run your life. The, the challenge is, excuse me, we don't learn this in school, and most of our friends don't do it. So that's why we don't do it. Mm. Right? Well, I'll tell you right now, any parent right now with a kid that's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, living at home with a job, try to get them onto the system. It's the best. Don't try. Do it. Do it. Open up that custodial account, which I did. It took an hour to do. It's a pain in the butt, but it's done, and I haven't done it for six years. Why don't we show our uh, our Kijiji video? Yeah, so this is another gentleman in our program, Tyson George. Uh, he's 17 years old, just bought a sixth investment property from London, Ontario. This is the Kijiji video, right? Uh, this is him right here. Uh, this is him in front of one of the investment properties. He's got such a great story. I'm going to show you this video right here. Uh, this right here, I'm just going to play it. Can you hear it, Gary? My yeah. name is Tyson. I bought a house on Kijiji with my own money when I was 15. So I started selling at the age of nine with the help of my grandfather. The two most important things that my grandfather taught me was one, to surround yourself with positive influences, and two, that at any age, you're able to make money. I was too young to get a job, so I used Kijiji to make my own. The most I ever made on a single purchase was I bought a bedroom set for $200 and within three days sold it for $1,600. I wanted to make money as soon as I could. I sold bedroom sets, stoves, fridges, movies, video games, lipstick, almost anything. Just two weeks after my 15th birthday, I used my own money to put a down payment on a townhouse. I had come up with the money all by myself. I don't think I would have been able to do it so quickly if it weren't for Kijiji. I can honestly say that I feel like a normal teenager. I play video games, I love playing basketball with my friends, and I still do all my business on the side. The day that I bought my first investment property, I had finally reached all my goals. And he's just an amazing individual. This guy right here is now he's 17 now, 15 he bought his first, now he owns six investment properties, six of them. And people, as he, you know, he's the smartest person in the class, which is nothing wrong being the smartest person in the class. He's not. Is his dad and or parents really rich? His parents provided nothing for him financially. Even if he wanted to buy a pair, a set of keys, and his parents bought it, they'd invoice him two bucks for the keys. They lent him no money. He saved up a down payment. He's Canadian, lives in London, Ontario, which is about two hours. It's like two hours outside of Toronto. And this gentleman is unbelievable. And again, he's an extreme case, but. Here's the point. Remember that mentorship I was telling you about? I'm telling you right now, if I'm 15, 16 and not doing it, I'd be curious to reach out to this gentleman. And I know he would take your call and he would talk to you about how he did it. He loves sharing his ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Don't leave your friends you have. Keep them, but try to add some good ones. Not good ones. Try, try to add some. <laughs> <laughs> the total raw, I didn't mean to say I, get, I, I ran out of water here. But try to, uh, try to find someone, some of them that are doing a little bit more than you where you can learn off them. Right. And that's the whole point. And that's what Enrich Academy is all about is surrounding yourself with great individuals like this, because he's got such a great story. And as I said, and people like because immediately when we see success like that, people are like, well, you know, is, is his parents rich? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, what is it? Well, uh, no. How about he just did it? Right. The biggest so. thing that's going to hold you back in life, guys, are the excuses that you tell yourself. Right. 
there is millions of people out there that just worked hard, saved their money, you know, uh, went the extra mile, you know, didn't grunt, you know, simple things that, you know, started early and have become incredibly successful. Uh, it isn't, you know, listen, there's, there's, there's a lot of incredible stories out there. And uh, we hope that, you know, we're starting to, you know, make you think about some of them. Uh, you know, it, it is it is so much between your ears. It is so much attitude. Don't you have to Darren Hardy said it best. You have to stand guard fiercely of the gate to your mind and don't let people give you excuses as, as to why you can't do something. You show up every day. You outwork everyone. You be kind. You be polite. You respond quickly. You go the extra mile and it will be amazing how fast your world will change. Well, it's interesting, like you take a look at what Enrich Academy has done. Hands down, we're number one in Canada doing this. Eventually, we're going to get into the States and make that huge as well. Uh, and you look at the, the results have been amazing. We have 25,000 students here that have to watch our program to graduate. Next year, that number is going to grow by a massive number because we've just done a really big deal, which we can't even talk about. But the average student that watches our program gives it, we just had 8,000 results, uh, survey results come in over the last three months. 8,000 survey results came in. The average student gave our program a 9.2 out of 10. 70% uh, of them gave it a 10 out of 10. Uh, that's how good this program has. And Gary wanted to talk about the takeaways. Uh, I wanted to make sure I, I brought them up. Yeah, just as the, just so we're cognizant of all of your time, thank you to everyone who is on this call today, to, to all the teens and uh, kids and young adults and, and to mom and dad. Uh, really appreciate you guys making the time. I always like to, you know, give some sort of draw or something. So for, for 10, 10 kids, and that can be anywhere, guys, from 10 years old to 25 years old, uh, there is a, I believe it's a 10 module enriched academy. It's a wealth mastery program. The basic entry fee is $600. We're not going to charge you for, the, for 10 kids that write us a one or two paragraph, um, uh, a one or two paragraph, uh, outline of why they think, you know, they'd like to participate in the wealth management program. We're going to look and we're going to choose 10 and we're going to post it on Facebook over the next few days. So if you're on here and you want to learn more and you want to get the entire wealth mastery program, you write us a, a uh, one or two paragraph uh, explanation as to why you getting part of this wealth mastery program and we're going to select 10 and give those away free of charge. You can send those to uh, me, Gary at dlc.ca, Gary at dlc.ca. I'll make sure that Kevin gets a copy of everything that you send. Um, but we're really excited about this. We want to give it away. We can't wait to hear, you know, some of you convince us. Kevin, anything else? Yeah, this is the package that we're going to send out to you. It's going to be great. Uh, and uh, again, it's $600 value, just so you know. Uh, we have OHL players that have gone through this, Ontario Hockey League. We have a lot of their players using this now, which is great. We've got uh, NHL players have gone through this. I mean, plumbers, electricians, doctors, lawyers. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the program is phenomenal. We put millions of dollars into it, millions and thousands of hours, more than you ever want to know, all condensed into seven, eight hours for the rest of your life. This program is life-changing. It is so damn good, and we're giving away. It unlocks it. It's lifetime access. Uh, send that out. It's going to be great. Uh, a couple of key getaway uh, takeaways. Number one is get a job. We've talked about that. Critical setup. Uh, next, number two, set up accounts and start saving. Number three, Gary, this one's for you. Go ahead. Which one? Don't Stop. grunt. Stop grunting. Stop grunting. Actually, be communicative. Be grateful, guys. You know what? Like, don't send one word answered. Send sentences. You know, get people to want to support you because they'd like you and think you're a really, really dynamic young kid. Love it. When you say one word answer, it's not just K if somebody asks you something. You say, How are you? Fine. Right. What's going on? Nothing. Right. I'm absolutely great today. Thank you for asking. How are you? That would be a really cool, right? Any communication, text, email, message, you will get recognized. People will, will make life easier for you. Um, the last thing that I'd ask all of you on this call today for us, um, if you found value in this program, uh, please share it on social media. Please post uh, it, um, make your comments, tag uh, me. If you're not a friend of mine on Facebook, please, uh, you know, friend me, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Kevin as well. Kevin Cochran, why don't you go over your handles? 
Yeah, absolutely. Go to Kevin Cochran. Uh, find me on Facebook. Easy to do that. You can go to Enrich Academy. We have a Facebook page, Instagram page, Twitter, everything. Make sure you do it. Uh, go there. We're always posting new information. We're just cutting up a Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad interview. Uh, Brian McGrath from the Calgary Flames. And next, uh, over the next two weeks, I'm interviewing uh, Brandon Copeland, who plays on the New England Patriots. Uh, really cool story. He saves 90% of every paycheck as an NFL player, which is unheard of. We're going to talk about how he does it and where he learned all this. It's really, really cool. So we're going to be doing that uh, sometime over the next two weeks. So make sure you log in because there's always new content going there too. Excellent, guys. Well, listen, thank you very much for tuning in to the Level Up Call. I've been really, really loving doing these series. Uh, next Thursday, we're going to take a day off. Actually, we're going to come back in two weeks. I'm going to try to get away for the weekend. So um, we just can't wait to uh, bring more great uh, content to you uh, going forward. Kevin, one of my closest, dearest friends, someone I admire more than you know almost anyone on the, on the planet today. Uh, you are uh, exactly who you come across. You are funny. You are a leader, you are engaging, you are smart, and you are so generous with your time and your interest in, in giving back. Uh, I just want to make sure that you know on behalf of all of us on this call today, how immensely grateful we are for your time, your thoughts, your vision. Uh, we love you, bud, and uh, and hope to have you back sometime. Hey, thanks, Gary, right back at you, bud. Like, you know what, what you're doing in the mortgage broker world is, is unreal. Like, I just really can't, there's not one person in the mortgage broker world that can't say they didn't have been done better because of you. You're hands down the biggest impact in that industry ever. Nobody can deny that. It's absolutely, I can't, everything I've learned from you. So thank you for that. Uh, and for all the parents listening right now, I know this might be an uphill battle for some of you where your kids are like, yeah, that was okay. Don't be, don't lose patience on it. Cause I know some parents, I'm already getting messages right now. My son loved it. Holy cow. They want their, my son, <laughs> my son is pulling my arm right now to go to the bank. This is great. Uh, that's yeah. a kind of stuff that we want. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you that aren't ready yet, that's okay, right? Just be patient with the process. Not all kids are cut from the same cloth. Uh, eventually, they're going to understand the importance of it. But the best thing you can do as a parent is be a leader and keep trying to drive this message through. Because the reality, if you're not teaching them now, they're the, you know they're going to learn this lesson one way or another. This is the easy way, right? The hard way is there's 30 living at home. That's the hard way. So <laughs> now, right? So thank you yeah, very much. And the most important thing with that last comment is to lead by example. We can't expect our kids to be something we're not. And if we haven't got there right now, we haven't been practicing, you know, um, you know, some of these exercises start. It's okay. We all slide, right? You know, we all yeah. look back and go, you know, I wish I would have done this sooner. And, and, you know, that's easy. All you got to do is just start today, right? Yeah. No big deal. We all slide in different areas of our life at different times. So uh, welcome back guys. And uh, thank you again, Kev. Have a great day. Thank please you. online guys. Really appreciate your feedback and please share this. Thanks guys. <laughs>